Good morning, Dr. Christensen. Good morning. Uh, I have been looking forward to this podcast for weeks. And uh, when when Chuck and I had a list of the 32 most influential, yes. um, there were a couple that we kind of argued over as to who we get to interview. And uh, I won the coin toss on you. Well, so, uh, so, so really am very pleased. Um, I always start with an intro. And uh, so I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. Okay. Uh, and so um, here is, I, I did some, some looking around on the internet and I found that, that uh, Senator Orrin Hatch uh, uh, read uh, a tribute to you to President Barack Obama in 2015. And I wanna just read a couple of the highlights from that. Um, Mr. President, it's an honor today to pay tribute to a renowned educator and highly regarded prosthodontist, Dr. Gordon J. Christensen in 1976. Dr. Christensen and his wife, Dr. Rella Christensen, a well-respected dental consultant, started Clinical Research Associates, now known as the CR Foundation. He's presently serving as CR's chief executive officer and is a member of the board of directors. Dr. Christensen and his wife volunteer full-time for CR to conduct research in all areas of dentistry. The Christensen's published the findings of their research in the Gordon J. Christensen Clinician's Report, a publication of the CR Foundation. The clinician's report is translated in seven languages and distributed to more than 100,000 dentists across 92 countries. Dr. Christensen also founded and directs practical clinical courses, PCC in Utah, an international consulting and educational organization providing courses and videos for dental professionals. In connection with PCC, he's presented over 45,000 hours of continuing ed throughout the world. As a frequent contributor to professional journals, Dr. Christensen holds editorial positions with 10 dental publications. He's also the recipient of many fellowships, masterships, and diplomas from various dental specialties and organizations worldwide. After more than 55 years in private practice, Dr. Christensen remains active in treating patients. He continues to influence dentistry across the world through his continuing education lectures and the clinician's report. He is truly one of dentistry's great leaders and it is with great respect, gratitude, and admiration and affection that I pay tribute to Dr. Gordon J. Christensen. So anyone in the dental business knows exactly who you are, but for the non-dental people, I think I can summarize it by saying, if there was a Babe Ruth of dentistry, you are probably him. So uh, welcome to the podcast and thank you so much for your time. We're gonna have an- You haven't embarrassed me. See, I've fooled a lot of people. A lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to get started. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I, I, I'd love to, first of all, um, you know, we talked as we were warming up about uh, COVID and um, I'm curious as to where the podcast is finding you. Where are you today? And how how are you adapting to the new COVID realities? Um, as you know, Rich, I'm also a psychologist, and the, the, the psych literature is just uh, totally filled with negative about uh, about virtual learning. I know we're stuck with it. Uh, I went from traveling two to three times a week uh, and uh, seeing face to face somewhere between forty and sixty thousand dentists per per year to the point uh, where it's all like we are right now. You're you're somewhere i'm somewhere and we can't even remember where one another is but the the bottom the bottom line is when you get a group a couple of the groups i've had have been over fifty thousand people on, on on a podcast like this but you're talking to the wall so the adaptation has been uh, horrendous uh, to uh, not have the eye to eye contact not have uh, any gestures it's just a talking head so in all of our courses, and I've done some 54 over this last 25 weeks, I guess, courses internationally, uh, we've tried to not have talking heads. We've, we've integrated some of our mentors. They're the people who teach with me, and uh, they are also volunteers. They're all over, all over North America. 
And uh, that has helped. And we're doing a lot of the chat. Of course, uh, Zoom, as you know, is one of the better platforms. And so it's been a horrendous adaptation. And uh, we've stayed relatively stable and financially stable, even though we're nonprofit. And uh, it has been unprecedented, let's say that. No question. Um, can you tell us where you grew up? How many siblings? Tell us a little bit about uh, growing up Christensen. Growing up, uh, I, I grew up in a, in a very blue collar family. My father was a carpenter and he uh, uh, gradually uh, got into uh, being a, a leader in a sugar factory, beet sugar factory. So I grew up in a little tiny house with an outside toilet <laughs> Wow! back in the, in the uh, 30s. And uh, it was quite an experience. I it was right in a, a northern Utah town, very, very small town, Lewiston, Utah. I spent my first six years. And my mother was highly, highly motivated that I would have some education. And so was my father. And bottom line was uh, that I had one brother older than I. And uh, he, uh, he gradually... Uh, well, he was in the Second World War. He survived uh, because he could type right. That was an interesting story. Uh, they, they were congregating in England, ready for Normandy. And uh, they asked who could type right. And that was considered a real wimpy thing for a man to do. That was a woman thing. But he, my mother was a secretary. So she, she had taught him and me how to type right. And he raised his hand, and that saved his life. Saved his uh, life. His, uh, his peers in high school then all were called the Normandy uh, in one big group. Half of them were killed. So uh, mm. he, he went to Italy and Switzerland and was a, was a clerk. <laughs> Gradually went to Stanford, got an MBA there, became president of the largest insurance company in the world. And uh, the two of us came from a very, very humble background, but wonderful, wonderful parents. Interesting. Um, and at what point did you decide to become a dentist? And what were the other things you were considering when you were um, in your yeah. teens and 20s? Very good question. Very good question. My uh, ecclesiastical leader happened to be a, a, a the Church of Jesus Christ, as you know. And... Um, uh, I've never been a real uh, lunatic religiously, but I've always been very, very involved with the religious things. I've taught seminary and done a lot of things with youth. And my ecclesiastical leader was also a uh, dentist, and he was an unbelievable role model. He a altru very altruistic man. Uh, he he served people constantly, gave away probably most of what he earned. And I thought, hmm, uh, he's doing a real service and. Uh, I loved uh, the, the physiologic aspects of, of humanity. I would go up in the mountains and find animals. Uh, we lived right in the mountain area in northern Utah. And uh, I, I looked at medicine, dentistry, engineering. Second year in, uh, in college, knowing nothing about any one of the three. <laughs> uh, uh, I was in a fraternity, Sigma Chi. And I was one of the only non-drinkers at that time. So the bottom line was one drunken night in a party. They said, well, what are you going to do? And, uh, and they said, why don't you flip a coin? And, and I was sober. They were. And we flipped a coin and it turned dentistry. And I, I'm, I'm sure that didn't make the decision. The big man made the decision. But uh, that was... Uh, was pretty influential in my life when I just put my put my wheels down and took off. And uh, amazing, I, I knew from junior high I wanted to be a dentist because of that one night. Yeah, well, and then the, that that man who influenced. Oh, right, of course. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the ways that I learned about. Um, about the Mormons was that I traveled for a year internationally after college and I met a lot of them on the road oh, in yeah. places like India. And uh, that, that's where I spent most of the time that I, that I had. I've, I've done a lot in India. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering where were you sent on your mission? I, and what I, did you learn from that? Denver, Colorado. Uh, and then of course that was the that was the puberty mission when you're just a kid. Uh, that, that, at that time, that was from 18 and up. 
Uh, and uh, I did a, a home mission because it was, well, it was right between the the uh, Korean War and the Vietnam War. I was in the Vietnam War in the, in the, in the military. And, uh, and so uh, they sent me to a home mission in Denver. But then subsequently, many years subsequently, uh, I was asked to administer a bunch of missionaries in La the Los Angeles, a huge Mormon temple there. And that was, that was just uh, 15 years ago. And oh, wow. that was an interval where I had to leave dentistry and only be involved with it one day a week for some years. Interesting. So um, my father, who, uh, who also was in the Army, I read that you spent some time in the Army Dental Corps. And my yeah. father always talks about the Army as one of the best experiences he ever had growing up. Now, I didn't know that you, he, he was in the Army during peacetime. Yes. But you were in the army during wartime. So yeah. I'm very interested to know how the army affected your growth and how now that I know that you were involved in really a uh, difficult war, I'm interested to know what that was like and what you learned. I uh, it was a, a boy scout growing up and uh, always... Uh, respected the military and the flag and the things that now people are trying to rip apart. And uh, I went through junior high school, high school, college, ROTC. Uh, I was a second lieutenant getting out of that. And uh, then, then that was medical service corps. And then went on and, and got a, a the captain rank as uh, I, I was on active duty. I was not in Vietnam. I was in Washington getting all troops ready, thousands of them to go to Vietnam. Mm. And that was an experience. I, I still think about that. And I saw things and learned things that I've never seen since. And uh, I tend to work hard. So they, uh, they, they saw that, and uh, uh, instead of being in a barracks with uh, 20 other dentists and one assistant, they finally gave me an assistant, and then in a, in, a, in a year, they gave me another assistant, and I was doing all the Crown Bridge for that huge group of uh, young people, thousands of them who came in from everywhere to be shipped off to Vietnam. Learned an enormous amount, 10 times more than dental school, not even mm. close. That was before I was a prosthodontist. I was a general. But uh, we did everything you could imagine from wounds to delivery of babies and you name it, you name it, we did it. Uh, so what a learning experience. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I still do military. I just talked in Garmisch, Germany to all the military commanders uh, uh, relative to uh, how to make dentistry more uh, efficient and how to uh, make it more long lasting, more predictable. I'm curious to know how, what are your secrets to a long life, not just long life, but long, healthy life? What are your routines? What, what can we emulate from the way you lived your life so that we can be in our 80s and as vibrant and contributory as you are? I can think of so much. I actually uh, teach classes on this very thing. It's called Faster, Easier, Higher Quality Dentistry. We stuck dentistry on there because most of them are dentists who come to the courses. The Dalai Lama said uh, in a book he wrote uh, that I read not too long ago that there were three levels of, uh, of vocation. And one of them, the bottom one, is a job. They have a job to to feed their family, to educate their children, maybe, but uh, and to support their drinking and smoking habits and all of the things. That, that, that level is the lowest level. I was in the grocery store not long ago uh, getting some groceries, and I could see the, the female clerk was depressed. And I said, well, how are you doing? And she said something I hear way too often from people. Same old, same old. You've heard that stupid phrase again and mm. again. Yeah. That's the job level. When do you get off? When do you get off? When do you get off? Uh, uh, not. The second level up is the professional level. That's the level, uh, now I'm quoting him, Dalai Lama, 
uh, that's the level where you you are in a, a group uh, and you're identified as a whatever in our case usually dentists or business people and uh, that that you have certain goals certain uh, let's say not limitations but uh, there, there's a certain way you have to be able. and then the top level is a passion and uh, you know what I'm going to say that, mm. that's someone who loves what they do finds joy in helping others and it doesn't matter whether it's a business person doing a, a legitimate and honest job we will be 3,000 companies and many of them do that effectively and others don't uh, it, whether it's business or whether it's uh, dentistry or whether it's law uh, there are passionate people and you, you mentioned some a minute ago and you have to think that's what they are that that's their life uh, and uh, and then if, if I get off that, I think I have a passion. You know, I could have retired 25 years ago well, financially. There's, money is not an object. And uh, if money is an object, uh, that's one of the problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Now, my, as I said, my brother was a Stanford MBA, and uh, he was uh, involved with heavy, heavy-duty business. And, uh, you know, there's business and then there's business. There's professional business and there's non-professional business, and he uh, he found it frustrating. He found it uh, that some of his peers were not the kind of uh, honest and respectable people he would like to know. But in any profession or business, that's the case. So uh, I would say a passion in what you do, not that you devote all your energies to that. Family has to come first. And second has to come uh, your professional life, and then and then down the line it gets to civic, it gets to religious, it gets to the other aspects, about five major aspects of life. And uh, now uh, you ask, how did I stay healthy? I don't know. The good Lord's been good to me that way. Seriously, my my dad, my brother lived to ninety four, dad. 93 mother was the one she was a little bigger woman than she should have been and uh, uh she she died in her 80s but uh, what about diet and exercise what what has been how did you live your life with regard to that and if you say you never of, exercise i maybe i don't want to know moderation. <laughs> all of it is moderation uh, literally i see people out jogging and i think well there's good statistics on that you only have so many miles on those joints right and uh, if you're going to use them up by 50, that's your choice. Uh, I'm I'm in my 80s, and I have no joint problem whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, I I was like any other kid, but I was one one year ahead of myself, so I was small. I didn't develop uh, physically fast, and I was small, and I, I was on the the uh, sophomore and the junior football team, and I got slaughtered every time. And uh, I didn't make the senior team, and I was devastated, devastated. Uh, I got into golf, I got into uh, rifle team, I got into debate, and uh, I got in. I got nationally going in debate, and you see where it's taken me. Uh, so I, thankfully, I didn't get on the senior football team. I go back to some of those graduation, uh, I mean, uh, the reunions now, and I see, I see most of the heavy duty athletes are either dead now, or they're in wheelchairs, or they are on a walk with using a walker. And I thought, hmm, I guess I had some destiny to <laughs> live longer because uh, that's, that is physical exercise in excess. Physical exercise in moderation is walking fast. Uh, when my staff goes with me, oh, there go, there he goes on the Gordon walk. Get, re get ready, and they, they've got to move a little faster. We go through airports in seconds. Uh, it, it's moderation. Don't get on the stupid moving sidewalks. Don't don't get in elevators. You know, I don't do fake exercise. I really don't. I do real world. I think that's what the good Lord had. That's why he made us physically fit is because we had to do things. Uh, and uh, I don't do the fault stuff, I, uh, but I take very active orientation in the real stuff. I was a Boy Scout master eight years hiking in the mountains and I ride horses. I do all kinds of physical things, but they're all real. I don't have a fake exercise. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> it's uh, you, you also are are known uh, for having one of the most accomplished spouses. Oh, who? Um, yeah, industry. yeah. I've married so far. <laughs> and so I'm curious to know how did you meet Dr. Rella Christensen? Okay. How you did theory. you know that she was the one for you? Because you, your, your, you, your careers have grown together, and it's it's just it's heartwarming to see it. And thank so, you, thank you. Well, it is a, a kind of a weird story. I, I went to one of the schools I attended, uh, well, dental school was University of Southern California. And I was poverty stricken, had no money. I was a janitor. I was a parking lot attendant. I sold Coca-Colas and hot dogs at the Rose Bowl. I did all kinds of slave jobs. And uh, among them was Hasher in the sororities. And uh, that doesn't mean anything to some of you listening, but that's a person who, who delivers the food to the young women in the sorority houses. I liked it, but in the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime uh, uh, I, one of them was the, was the sorority that Rella was in. And uh, I, uh, I remember the night very well. Now, uh, that night, uh, when Rella was, uh, was basically talking to me, I spilled food on her, and I thought, uh, well, <laughs> inadvertently, and uh, I thought, well, why don't we, uh, I'll ask her for a date. So uh, I did, and that started it, and we knew within, that was 1959, if you would believe. We've been married 61 years now. Amazing. And uh, so uh, we live pretty independent lives. We're together on the weekends. We have our, our normal date night. Uh, uh, we're we're involved. We have we have our times when we get very animated in our discussions. Uh, and uh, but we always have respected one another. She's she's expert in one area. I might be slightly expert in another area, and we interdigitate that and. Uh, it's worked beautifully well, but uh, being a Mormon bishop as I was for uh, for some years, I learned a lot about marriage, and uh, I do have a PhD in psychology. So I I learned a lot about how to keep a marriage together. And, and, and it, shut up and listen. <laughs> is that is that does that summarize <laughs> all of the lessons together? That's, That's true uh, of all parts of life. Just listen a lot. <laughs> listen a lot. Listen till it hurts. Yeah. So true. Yeah. Um, so on to um, on to an article that I saw that you wrote uh, in 2003. The title of it is "I've Had Enough." Did oh you, yeah. You remember that? Is that is yeah. that worth? Well, I've, you mind I've, discussing that? I've written well over 500 articles and journals all over the earth. And, this uh, is the one that still comes up in the oh, first page of that Google. One has, that one has had more reprints than any other article I've ever written. I mean, I, I, when I first wrote it, I had piles of letters that six inches deep. Uh, I have had enough. I think it's time. To, as I mentioned uh, a little while ago, relative to business, and it's true of dental or medical or whatever, uh, there are people who are devoted to helping others, and then there are others with a, more, a goal of money only. And uh, the over-treatment that prompted, prompted that article was rampant at that time. Uh, eight veneers on somebody that needed a bleach. Uh, you know, <laughs> all kinds of just crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, on young people, uh, I, I would see people come in. Uh, I live right here by Brigham Young University and Utah Valley University. There's 65,000 students in this small community. So there are a lot of, of uh, students from everywhere, a lot from California. And California was one of the hotbeds of this over-treatment at that time. This has been quite a few years ago when uh, veneers were very popular. They were, they were new, so everybody wanted to do them. And uh, I would see, I'm not exaggerating at all, I would see eight or ten veneers on somebody that needed a, a, a bleach or a couple of diastema closures with resin. And I thought, this is sick. I would, uh, and then I'm on hospital staff, and I, I would see, 
Oh, I would see uh, many things that uh, are out of my realm of, of total knowledge, but I would see too many hysterectomies. I would see uh, all kinds of things that were uh, done that really didn't need to be done. Uh, and that really frustrated me. Uh, we're, we're, one of our mantras in any medical area is do no harm. And I was seeing harm. I was seeing the teeth cut down at age 18 that mm. shouldn't have been touched. And that it prompted me to say, let's think logically about what we're doing. Let's not over treat. Uh, it, it got killed by the recession. You, you know that the recession would not allow. We lost, what was it, 27% of indirect restorations in dentistry during the, the Great Recession of years ago. And uh, it is coming. Never came back? Yeah, no, it never came back. came huh? back slightly, but now COVID came on and that wiped it again. We're, yeah. we're back to reality again. We're back to who we are, which is... Uh, trying to preserve teeth, not just make people, everybody look like toilet bowl white, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, that article has been very popular. <laughs> so do, do, you, do you think it's getting, it's, so I, I would assume that you, you would think that it's better now than it was in 2003. Yeah. But when you look toward the future, do you think there's, um, what do you see with regard to what you wrote in 2003? Do you see history repeating itself or? Uh, I, I, well, then there was a lot of affluence among the general public, as you know, back in 2003. Uh, I think it was a time when uh, most dentists were doing exceedingly well. Only a few were struggling. And uh, therefore, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on money, a lot of emphasis on the triple digits of, of, of income. Uh, was, that's not where we are. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's nice to have enough money. It's nice to have a, a growth each year. But to aim at that is stupid. I, I don't care what profession they're in or business they're in. To aim at just money is not, uh, not where we are. I'm not here for that reason. So uh, I'm, I'm seeing right now... Uh, uh, we're, we're kind of at our roots again, which is mm. uh, we, we treat three major diseases, as you know, or conditions, whatever you want to call it. We overtreat caries. We know about perio, but don't treat it much. And we can't even spell occlusion. We have three <laughs> things. Uh, and uh, uh, we're kind of back to the roots again, because people know that that, that is where, where we that's why we exist. We don't yep. exist to make everybody lovely and gorgeous, uh, although that's one of the things it's part of it. we can do. And I, I'm seeing uh, kind of a leveling of that extravagant and over, over treatment that we saw back in the early 2000s. Thank goodness. If you were a 35-year-old dentist, mm -hmm. uh, what would you be worrying about today? <sighs> Uh, a lot of things in, uh, uh, let's see, what was the year? Uh, uh, it's been about 15 years ago. Uh, I paired with Howie Ferran and with uh, Rich Maddow and uh, a few others, and we got all our databases together, and we had oh, tens of thousands of dentists who polled them. I polled them on what's bothering you. What's bothering you? Mm. And uh, third party was the major thing. Oh, that was 99%, third party payment. That, that was just numero uno, not even, not even debatable. And then there were, we, we had established 20 different things that were bothering the dentist. And I would like to see, well, it's much like government today. Uh, I would like to see much more uh, interaction with the various sides of any any argument, which we don't see in government right now. I can't even read the newspapers, and I have a hard time watching the news for that reason. Uh, we ought to be able to talk to one another. We ought to we ought to be able to sit down with third party people, and uh, I know that can be done and and negotiate. Uh, uh, when I uh, first came to Utah many years ago. 
uh, a third party did not pay for sealants. A third party did not pay for occlusal splints. I went to the head people in those in the major companies, third party companies, and said, "Look, if we do sealants, you're not in. Let's use today's fees. If you do sealants at fifty dollars, uh, you're not going to do a crown at twelve hundred dollars later." Oh. If we put an occlusal splint in the 35% of the population who has uh, uh, bruxism, they're going to eat the split and you will not have a, a $32,000 uh, rehab at age 45. Oh, and we got both of those in. Uh, I think uh, the discussions, I wish we could do that with government right now. Uh, I, see, I see things I cannot even believe happening. Uh, we need more communication. Uh, and with 45% uh, of the population, either in corporate or a group, uh, I think uh, I, I have written articles positive about corporate, positive about group. And there's some negative to that. There's some negative to private practice. Uh, uh, all we need to do is recognize our different modes of practice. And uh, again, that's communication, communication, and we don't have it. Yeah, I'm right, true. you're wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. I, I just, I can't tolerate that. And not just in dentistry, it's everywhere. 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 Yeah. 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 Um, I, uh, I happen to, uh, struggle with posture. My my, and I'm not a dentist, but uh -huh. I I'm 50 years old almost. I'm 49, and uh, I I am very cognizant of, and I have terrible neck issues. And when I see your posture <laughs> at, at age, in, in, in your advanced age, and the fact that you've been a dentist your whole life, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that posture is on the minds of many dentists right now, because it's one yes. of the things that can be a true gotcha in retirement. No so question. What, at, being a dentist your whole life, how did you wind up with such impressive posture? Did you work at it or is this just good luck? Uh, no, it, it's a combination of the two. Uh, during my, I've helped start two dental schools in one major CE center. And one of the dental schools I helped start years ago in the 60s was University of Kentucky. During that time, there was a lot of emphasis on, uh, on posture when practicing, on uh, hand movements, on high velocity evacuation. There were lots of things uh, that came on during that time that were, that were highly influential then and even today. Uh, just as recently as yesterday, Rella showed me the current study she's doing on uh, on uh, all of the sucking machines that that you. I don't have to mm -hmm. tell you that everybody's buying, and uh, we've tested many, and you'll be very interested to see the reports when they come out. We're not mm -hmm. done yet. We we finished it with uh, with smoke, where uh, we put the various machines in, and we find out where is the smoke going and uh, uh, how much of it is uh, in, in the operatories. And guess what? Something that we, in uh, Clinton's report, proved uh, 25 years ago is still valid. The high-velocity evacuation used properly takes up to 90% of the garbage okay. away. Some of these devices that they're now selling heavily only redistribute it everywhere and behind the masks, behind, not the masks, behind the shields. Mm. Uh, and uh, so we've done it with particulate matter and smoke. Now we're going into actually organisms and uh, the particulate matter. Uh, but that, that, that's such an example of, uh, of where we are. The, the, the bottom line is a lot of these studies that are going on now are going to really change the, the way we practice. No, no question in mind. Yeah. Um, can you share with, with the audience that there must, I, I'm going to ask for only two. I bet you have dozens, but what are the two products that you think every single dentist should have that you don't see many dentists uh, either know about or they don't have, but what are two that come to mind that you think? Thank, thank you, Rich. That's a really good question. I have a whole course on that that goes a couple of days. We did a study on 47 technologies. Number one was, and I think you've got a lot of stuff stirring around in your mind, 
uh, that they could not vote on this. We polled the profession. They I can't wait to hear what it is. They could I, not. I do have an idea. Unless they had used the concept. Combing. Combing was number one, not even debatable. Uh, you hear questions like, that changed my life. I've seen things I've never seen before. It's changed every treatment plan. It's just one thing after the other, after the other, after the other. So cone beam is right on the top. And uh, what other things should they get? I'll, I'll say, obviously, cone beam is going to run you 65K to 150K. And uh, so you It's getting better, less expensive every year. Yeah, so. yeah, it is. Thank goodness mm. it is. Thank goodness it is. Uh, some of the studies we do are really appalling. We did one a while ago on uh, just panoramic. And we found uh, 25% of American dentists don't even have panoramic. Oh. And of those who have panoramic, 25% of those are still analog. So, you know, I'm thinking, huh? Uh, the so-called, it's a trite phrase, digital workflow. Uh, you guys have done so well in, uh, in looking at, uh, you talk about posture. Uh, that, uh, when I was in your East Coast uh, demonstration facility, I was very Center impressed point that, that you've got some some smaller operatories for hygienists. Uh, you, you've done some really creative things. And okay. I see certain other, I'll not name them, the groups that come in and tell, tell the dentist what to do. They start to work in it and think, huh? I don't want the sink over there. I want it over here. You know, it's it's pretty interesting to see. Uh, I would say digital workflow would be the, the second thing. The second one is digital workflow. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, <laughs> what advice would you give to your 20 year old self? If you can go oh. back in time and coach your own self at age 20, <laughs> what would you tell yourself? Um, uh, again, I could give you a whole day lecture on that. <laughs> Uh, it's almost a, a scriptural thing, you know, doing others as you would have them do unto you. That's number one. Uh, have empathy, enthusiasm, positive thinking. I, I, I polled many leaders. How many years ago would this be? The Alpha Omega fraternity, then almost all Jewish, obviously, asked me if I would uh, look at well, they gave me an award, but I'll get off that. And, and they wanted me to give a talk on, on leadership. So I pulled 100 leaders uh, by their biographies and autobiographies. And they were people like Dwight Eisenhower, uh, Norman Vincent Peale. They were people in, in every aspect of life, business, religion, uh, uh, medicine, law, the, the whole gang. And of all... Of of all those leaders, the number one characteristic that they felt gave them their leadership uh, potential and influence was positive thinking. Hmm. That was number one. Every one of them, we can do it, we can do it. Look, look at Churchill, never give up. Uh, you, you, you know, every one of them had the same orientation. I can do it. Just shut up and let's do it. Mm -hmm. Get her done. Do it now. All of those phrases came, one after the other after the other, from the, from the leaders. And then uh, it went down the line, and you got others that were most of them uh, being organized. People asked me, well, how do you practice? Do religious stuff, also do uh, family things? And I say, well, there's a priority. You put family in the planner first, and then comes, then comes business, then comes so forth down the line. And then you just live by that. <laughs> but, great uh, advice yeah uh, that, that get organized and don't don't look at the half full cup look at the <laughs> look at the upper side of the <laughs> cup i'll tell you we what? don't see it enough you don't see it enough i totally agree um what what books have you recently gifted or, or, or not recently, but over your lifetime, what books do you find yourself giving as gifts? Uh, I, I'm, I'm psychologically oriented as you know, and I, I think uh, the, the human mind 
is not used nearly enough. Uh, as an example, I don't do a lot of sedation. The sedation uh, I can use by by influencing. This is this is your anesthesia up here. I can take a needle and stick it right through my hand and come out the other side and not feel it. Hmm. But I have to jazz myself up. Uh, I can take a patient who can't have general anesthetic or even sedation and spend a couple of half hour sessions. Now there's the downside that takes a couple of half hours and get them to the point where um, uh, I have to tell you a story. It's a very interesting story. Please. When I went in the military, uh, uh, I, I did not have the psychologic background or education. And the old colonel uh, in, uh, was in charge, who was in charge of the oral surgery clinic, which was huge during the war, unbelievable, because uh, all those kids would come in mutilated and uh, we'd have to fix them. And he said, Christensen, don't give them any had a few expletives. Uh, don't give them that anesthetic. He'd say, look, let me show you what to do. And I could not believe what he showed me. This was a guy um, that I still remember, crude old guy. He knew every, every expletive in the English language, I'm sure. But he, um, he used hypnosis. And um, he, this sounds, sounds bizarre. Mm. He would t- take a couple of sessions with a kid who was terrified. And uh, when I say kid, 18, 19, 20, uh, after that time, he would say, okay, I'm going to call you the day we're going to do this. And I will tell you what your mind is going to do. When you come in, the lower right side will be totally numb. I watched him do that. And I thought, this is, this is witchcraft. And that got me very interested in psychology. That's why I did the PhD in it. Uh, the the, uh, the hypnosis, the human mind is so powerful. True. And therefore, uh, there, there are so many psychologic books. I, I, I hate to even mention uh, one. Uh, but uh, as, as we go through uh, the psychology things, I have one uh, grandson right now who's looking at medical. He's looking at... Uh, 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 oh, a lot of the homeopathic things, looking at medical school, he's uh, just ready to, to do one of those things. And I tell him, the mind can do almost anything with the sympathetic nervous system. I can stop urination till I actually bloat. I can, mm. I, I can, I can stop a headache uh, with about the, the 10 minutes of contemplation and telling myself it isn't there. Uh, so a lot of the psychology books, but, uh, then how to influence uh, people, uh, and you know that one. How to win friends and influence the kind of it's a classic. Yeah, there there are certain books. If you look behind me, I don't know if you can see it. I, I can see them. Yep. Uh, now you can see the books. <laughs> I can. Yep. Uh, I don't worship those books because they're almost historic now, but I've got some old, I, I was looking at some old G.V. Black books. I have some of his textbooks from uh, 1908. I was oh, just my goodness. At historic. Saying the things to, uh, we're saying the things today, thinking they're new, that he was saying in 1908. Really? 120 years ago. Yeah. And then that's true. That's why I tend to dwell on the psychologic more than the physiologic. The physiologic, she has use every year. You know, butter's good, butter's bad. Uh, uh, <laughs> exercise is good, exercise is bad. That changes constantly. But how to influence the human mind doesn't. <laughs> Interesting. But, yeah. So here's a, here's a broad question, not a dental one. What frustrates you in the world today? <laughs> The, the lack of um, empathy among among people. Uh, I see uh, Trump's done a lot of good things. He's done a lot of things that disgust me. And, and that's the lack of empathy, the name calling, the, the, the other sounds, let's get off the politicians. But, but uh, in any aspect of life, uh, well, here's an example. Your wife comes in. Your wife has the hideous new dress on. Uh, <laughs> how do you like my new dress? Now you could say, it's a piece of junk. I don't like it. Or you could say, hmm, 
it's really a good length on you. You know, there, there, there's always something good to find <laughs> in, in what another person is doing. Uh, you know, people tend to look at, at, at Trump. I hate to mention him, but he's made such a, a furor. Uh, there's some good things, you know. We got to think about the good things. Uh, and, yeah, he's done some unbelievable bad things, but... Uh, uh, Every one of us has those kind of characteristics. It's true. <laughs> I would like to see empathy, uh, thinking before speaking. That's why I've stayed married so long. I don't know if, I, if, I, if she says something I don't like, I just grin. <laughs> <laughs> and that always solves it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this hour that we've got this, we've just been able to spend together. Well, thank um, you. I have to. I, uh, your publication, CRA, is one of the few, well, not the few, but I do read a number of dental publications. Yours is the one I look forward to the most. The reason being, it's short, it's sweet, it gets right to the point, and you speak in simple terms so that non dentists can also understand it. And so I just want to tell you that I'm completely appreciative of what you publish. And I'm sure that others uh, would agree. It, it's my favorite dental publication. So thank you for all of the work that you're doing at CRA. Thank, please pass on to Dr. Rella Christensen how much we appreciate all the work that she's done and continues to do. And uh, thank you once again for spending this morning hour with me, everyone. Uh, Dr. Christensen was up at 6 a.m. for all of us to, uh, to enjoy this hour together. So thank you again for that. And uh, I really want to say thank you and uh, thanks for all of your contributions. Well, Rich, uh, talking about Benko, you guys have done an outstanding job. And now, not to depreciate Shiner, Patterson, or Ben Cor, Getze, or the rest of them, but uh, in the meantime, uh, you have come uh, from being family owned and being directed by you and Chuck and your dad. I think it's an outstanding tribute to you that uh, you're all working together and you're doing some heavy duty stuff. You're influencing women in the profession. You're doing you're doing some altruistic things that uh, are very admirable. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you once again, Dr. Thank Christensen. You. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.